Shalom. This is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to part three of the new podcast series, The Fall Feasts of Adonai. And in part three, we're on the final lesson on the Feast of Rosh Hashanah. And in part one and part two, we found out that these are not the feasts. They're actually the Moedim. They are appointed times. Singular is Moed, plural is Moedim. We also found out that Rosh Hashanah was a name made up by the rabbis to celebrate the New Year, which has got nothing to do with the Moed itself, with the appointed time itself in Leviticus 23. In the Bible, in Hebrew, it's called Yom Teruah, the day of the blast. And it's uh, very likely that it means the day of the shofar blast. And now finally we're in part three and we really want to address the idea of how Yom Teruah, the day of the blast, actually testifies of Jesus. Remember John in John 5.39, Jesus says, All scripture testifies of me. He is talking to the scribes. He is talking to the chief priests. He is talking to Pharisees. This is in John chapter 5 and in verse 39. And when he's talking to them, he's talking to them in 24 to 30 AD, and the only Bible they had were the Hebrew Scriptures that we call the Old Testament. And the main foundational books of the Hebrew Scriptures was the Torah. And in the Torah is this Moed, this feast, this appointed time of the Lord. That's now called Rosh Hashanah, but in actually the Bible calls it Yom Teruah. How does Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, how does it testify of Jesus? Now for Robin and I, we celebrate this feast, Yom Teruah. We have a dinner and we have apple crisp and uh, whipped cream. I blow the shofar and we sing some songs and we pray. We have a special holy gathering after sunset tonight. It's commanded by the Lord. But we do it based upon a lot of the things that I'm going to bring up in this session. That indeed, this feast, this moed, testifies of Jesus. Remember a major goal of the podcast that I do on Torah? the Gospel according to Moses Genesis and the Gospel according to Moses Exodus, the major goal is, is actually see that. Where is Jesus in the Torah? And the feast of Yom Teruah is in the Torah. It's the, I mean, the, the primary chapter is Leviticus 23. So we want to meet God on his Moedim. We want to see Yeshua. Our focus is Jesus and how Rosh Hashanah testifies of him. So we again return to the very words of God. And again, Jesus gives us instruction in John 5.39 that all Torah testifies of him. Now, it's not how Rosh Hashanah is celebrated today with its Jewish traditions and rituals made up by the rabbis that are related to Jesus. But we want to go back and hear the way they did it and see how they saw and understood and how this will help and enhance our faith and our walk with Jesus. So let's consider to do a Rosh Hashanah event, but in the Christian perspective, praise and worship and a big community meal. But we need to see Jesus in the feast. We need to see Jesus in the Moed of the Lord. These are gods. They don't belong to the Jewish people. So as we take the rabbinic traditions out of the way and we return to the days of Jesus, perhaps this will help us see him clearly and how this feast testifies of Jesus. But a second major goal is the disciples. How did they see the feast related to Jesus. How do they understand it? What do they hear? 
And once we come to grips with how it was applied in Jesus' day, or maybe how the disciples actually understood it, it will become something very important for us as Christians today. So we're going to take a look at a number of shofars. We're going to consider four of them. I don't say this is a complete list. I'm just taking a look at four. There are perhaps more. Perhaps more that you could suggest. So the shofar is not for us, it's for them. And once we understand how they looked at it, how they may have applied it to Jesus, it will help us to walk with Jesus in a deeper way. Now, Rosh Hashanah in Jesus' day, we have two, three, maybe references that help us. The one is Philo, the great Jewish philosopher in Jesus' day, probably not deeply religious, but in his writings he talked about this feast, Yom Teruah. He does not use the name Rosh Hashanah. He said in his own writings, it's the day of blowing an instrument. And he said definitely it's probably related to the teruah, the blast, the sharp noise, and the roar on Sinai. We read that in Exodus 19.16 and in 19.19. That there was a strong noise of the shofar, a chazach. Definitely a blast, a sharp noise. And more than likely, the disciples of Jesus would understand this clearly. There was, as it says in the Torah, a loud shofar blast on Sinai. A loud shofar blast. So it seems that maybe God is hinting and saying, Listen, on the first day of the seventh month, on the first day of Tishri, on the day of the new moon of the seventh month, remember, remember the day of the blowing of the shofar on Sinai the day that you entered a new covenant with me. So the disciples of Jesus, they're religious Jews. The Torah was the foundation of their Bible. They would remember the blast. And they probably have a special service because God commanded a special holy service on the first day of Tishri, as we read in Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. They'd remember all Israel gathered at Sinai, all of them. The Torah says there were thunderings at Sinai, kolot. But kolot also means speaking a language. The rabbis, after Jesus' day, they said God spoke in 70 tongues. God spoke in 70 kolot. It wasn't thunderings, it was voices. And 70 is the number in Judaism and in the Old Testament that represents all nations. And the rabbis would say, all nations would hear the covenant. But perhaps there's something more going on. Perhaps the disciples, once they understood and once they heard, obviously in the Torah, about the great shofar blast at Sinai, they started thinking about something that happened at Shavuot, at Pentecost, in their day, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Now both events, and what I mean, the event that happened at Sinai and the event that happened on Pentecost after Jesus ascended, they both occurred at the mountain of God. You can read about this in uh, Exodus 24, 13, that Sinai is the mountain of God, and also in Isaiah 2, 3, and many other places, that the mountain of God moved, and it was now in Jerusalem. Both happened on day 50. Shavuot, Pentecost, in Leviticus 23, 15 through 16, is the 50th day after the Feast of Bikarim during the Feast of Passover. But if you actually count the days, starting in, in Exodus 19.1, when all of this started happening, they, they were there on the 50th day at Sinai, 
after leaving Egypt. Both events involved the presence of God. One event talked about 3,000 people who died because of their sin. When Moses received the Torah, this is in Exodus 32, 28, but we read about 3,000 people who believed and were born again to a new life when the Spirit came, and that's in Acts 2, 41. 3,000 people believed and received a new life. We talk about kolot. Can mean thunderings, but it can mean tongues. And how later rabbis would say, yes, God spoke in tongues at Sinai, so all nations would understand the covenant and the Ten Commandments. And at Pentecost, we read about the tongues and languages. And the thousands and thousands of Jews who were gathered there and Gentiles and heard the message of the gospel in their own language. God wrote the revelation and the covenant on stone tablets but said but God said that at a fulfillment and in the, at the fulfillment of Pentecost that he would write his law on our hearts. We read this in 2 Corinthians 3:3 3, 3, and Jeremiah 31:33. God gives his Torah at Sinai and in those 40 years Torah means teaching, but he gave the Spirit on Shavuot. The Spirit was our teacher. Jesus said that in John 14, 26. These are amazing, interesting connections between what happened at Sinai and what the mountain of God and what happened at the mountain of God at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem after Jesus' ascension. And both involved teruah. Now remember, teruah means blast or roar, a violent noise. And in Exodus 19.16, there was a loud noise, a strong noise, a chazach of the shofar. And in Acts 2, verse 2, it talked about a sound of the wind. The Greek word there is akos, a roar, a loud noise. A teruah. Both events involved a teruah. So Rosh Hashanah and Yom Teruah. The rabbis say it's a, a new year, but that's not in the Bible as it's associated with the feast, the Moed, Yom Teruah. They say, remember the creation, that this this day, the first day of Tishri, is the birthday of the creation. It's that the sixth day of the creation, when God created Adam and Eve, and a rabbi in 160 AD said that the world was created at 3760 BC. And if we take a look at Rosh Hashanah on the first of Tishri in the year 2021, we find out that we enter into the year 5782. That means 5782 years ago, was 3760 BC which is the sixth day of creation but that's not in the Bible as it relates to the feast oh yeah creation's there but not this date and it's and, and it's not in the Bible that God said remember the creation on Yom Teruah the rabbis say the books of life and death are opened on Rosh Hashanah are you going to be written in the book of life or the book of death? But that's not in the Bible as related to the feast. In Leviticus 23, 23 to 25, it just talks about to remember the blast. It doesn't even say remember the shofar blast. But they talk about the shofar. They talk about it as a warning that you should repent, that the day of the judgment is coming. This gets interesting. Because pretty soon we begin to see some of these thoughts of the rabbis begin to come connected with the idea of Jesus, the Messiah. In the shofar, we're looking forward to the days of Messiah. And so all of a sudden here we have the disciples who were probably very well aware of the day of the shofar blast at Sinai. Yom Teruah on Mount Sinai, the great ear-shattering noise on the mountain of God. 
And all the Hebrews and others gathered at the mountain of God to enter into the new covenant. And in the Bible we talk about Yom Teruah on the Temple Mount. A great ear-splitting noise of wind on the mountain of God. And there were Hebrews from all over the world and God-fearing Gentiles who were gathered there at the mountain of God to enter into the new covenant. So indeed, one shofar, one shofar that the disciples would understand would be that shofar that was blown at Sinai. That loud, splitting noise at the mountain of God. And it could very well be that they associated it with the loud, splitting noise of the wind at the mountain of God at Jerusalem. And so all of a sudden, Anyam Teruah, also known as Rosh Hashanah, we Christians can say, we remember the new covenant at Sinai, but we remember the new covenant at Jerusalem in Jesus. So again, we talk about the second major goal of the podcasts that I'm doing on the Torah, and that is, how did the disciples hear the word? How did they, what did they see in the word? What did they understand? And so therefore, we can see how they applied this to Jesus, how they saw Jesus, and how the Torah testified of him. So let's take a look at a second shofar. Not for us again, but a shofar for them, something that they really understood. I think a second shofar they probably be remember is when Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. His name is Shlomo, the king of peace. That's what Solomon's name means, peace. And they blew the trumpet. But in Hebrew it doesn't say that in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39. It says they blew the shofar. And all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon. And later, and, and later on in 1 Kings 4.25, it says, So Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of King Shlomo, all the days of the King of Peace, all the days of Solomon. Blowing the shofar when the King of Peace is anointed king. But in Jesus' day, the Jews were looking for the fact that Messiah was going to come. They knew that the Messiah would be the king of the universe. They knew that Messiah would come and take the throne of David. His shalom would be universal. It would not just be peace from Beersheba to Dan, and just in Israel. It would be universal peace. So you read in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And it will come about in the last days. And again, the last days, obviously, is the day we are when Jesus is going to return. That the mountain of the house of the Lord, which is Jerusalem, will be established at the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people shall stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So now we can see that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord is Jerusalem, and the mountain of the Lord was Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty, distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and they will never again, and never again will they train for war. Now listen to this. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid for the loud for the mouth of the Lord has of hosts has spoken. King Shlomo anointed king of Israel the king of Shalom and in his days every man lived under his vine and his fig tree and here in the prophet Micah's book, we get this prediction that in the last days, the Messiah would come 
and each man will live under his own vine and his fig tree, the king of peace. What does Jesus say? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Jesus is all about shalom. He's all about bringing peace. But in Revelation 19, 16, what was written on his robe? What was written on his thigh? It was said in Revelation 19, 16, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, Melech Shlomo, the King of Shalom. Melech Shalom. And so for the disciples, could it be that the second shofar they remembered was the shofar that announced that King Solomon was king? And in those days, every man would live under his vine and his fig tree. But then they read the prophets that when Messiah would come, every man would live under his vine and his fig tree. And Jesus is called King of Kings. And Jesus says, my shalom I leave with you, and my shalom I give to you. Another aspect about King Shlomo, King Solomon. He built the permanent house of the Lord. And when you read in 1 Kings, especially in chapter 7 and 8, it was dedicated in the seventh month, <laughs> the Moed of Sukkot. We'll be talking about Sukkot as we keep on in this podcast series. In 1 Kings 8, verses 1 through 2, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers of the households of the sons of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. All the men of Israel assembled themselves to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim. And Ethanim is the name of the seventh month prior to the Babylonian exodus when the Hebrews came back out of the exile from Babylon they took the names of the months from Babylon and they started using them that's where the month of Tishri comes but in Solomon's day it was called Ethanim the seventh month so in the seventh month, we remember when God came to dwell with in his house. But Paul teaches us, do you not know that you, plural, you all are a temple, not temples. This is in 1 Corinthians 3.16. The actual Greek says that you all, as a group, are one temple. It's a temple, a singular temple, not temples. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. I asked the question many times of people, who dwells in us? And everybody says, the Holy Spirit. And I said, really? Does it say that in the Bible? Yep, it does. 1 Corinthians 3.16. But guess what? It also says that Jesus dwells in us. James 14, verse 20. Romans 8, 9 through 11. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Galatians 2, verse 20. Jesus dwells in us. He says, wait a minute. You got the Holy Spirit dwelling on us, and now you got Jesus dwelling on us. What's going on? It's getting a little crowded here. Doesn't Jesus have anything better to do to dwell with us? He's got the Spirit with us. But then in Ephesians 2, verse 22, John 14, verse 23, and 1 John 4, verse 15. Let me repeat these. Ephesians 2, verse 22. John chapter 14, verse 23, and 1 John 4, verse 15. God dwells in us. Huh? Who dwells in us? God. And we are His temple. We are one temple. The sound of the shofar. Yam Teruah. Indeed, let us rejoice and be glad, for your salvation has come. And Jesus' name, Yeshua, in Hebrew means salvation, God's salvation. Sound the shofar, yam teruah, yam teruah shofar. Rejoice and be glad, for your shir Yeshua has come.
So now we see another way that perhaps this Moed, Yam Teruah, the day of the blast, a.k.a. Rosh Hashanah, testifies of Jesus. Is there a third way that perhaps the disciples would hear a shofar in their day? Now, so far, these two shofars that we just talked about are in the Torah and in the Hebrew Scriptures. The first one we talked about was the Torah blast on Mount Sinai. And we read about that in Exodus. The next one is the Torah blast when King Shlomo, the king of peace, King Solomon, becomes king. And that's in 1 Kings. So for the disciples, what might be a third shofar? One that they would have heard that they would have heard on a regular basis. And again, we go back to Leviticus 23, verse 24. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, where in Hebrew it actually says, a reminder of the blast, teruah. And we can see how God's word seems to imply that must mean the sound of a shofar. And we ask why? Because of those first Hebrews. The first Hebrews are the ones that read this for the first time about this law and about remembering the blast. And they remembered the blast on Mount Sinai when they were 50 days out of Egypt. And it was the day of the new covenant at the mountain of God when all, all Israel was gathered around that mountain. Now let's consider Passover. The day of the lamb sacrifice. Now on Passover, in Jesus' day, the daily sacrifice was done early. There were two, there were every day of the year, 365 days a year, a lamb was sacrificed in the morning, one lamb sacrificed at about the third hour, and another one sacrificed at the ninth hour. So about nine o'clock in the morning and about three o'clock in the afternoon. But on Passover, that daily sacrifice in the afternoon is done early because the gates of the temple are then opened and the people file in to bring in their Passover lambs. When the courtyard was full, the gates are closed and a shofar is sounded blowing all across the Temple Mount to indicate the start of the sacrifice of the Passover lambs for the people. This happens about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. At the ninth hour, as we read in the Bible, the Lamb of God, Jesus, was crucified and died. He was sacrificed for all the people. A shofar was blown in the priest's court that at the same time Jesus died outside the walls. The shofar blows and we remember the blood of the Lamb. We remember in Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So again, we take a look at Yom Teruah, a.k.a. also known as Rosh Hashanah. And the, latter, and the rabbis later, after Jesus' day, had brought in some of their man-made customs. But some of these man-made customs are beginning to relate. Like, for instance, today they have apples and honey. The Jewish people during their synagogue service that will probably happen on the evening of Rosh Hashanah. And they would say, may you have a beautiful, sweet year. But we would say, wait a minute. No. It's a sweet life. For in Jesus we receive new life. The rabbis would say the books are open. The book of life and the book of death. 
Yeah, the book of life. And John writes of this in Revelation, that the book of life is the Lamb's book of life. We talk about the shofar. They say it's a warning. A warning to repent now because the day of judgment is coming. It's a time to remember our sin. It's a time to seek God's forgiveness. The shofar also was looking forward to the days of Messiah. And the disciples heard the shofar on Passover. They heard the teruah, the blast. They knew the command regarding Yom Teruah. Remember the blast. And the shofar blast at the mountain of God in Jerusalem on the day Jesus died. We remember the shofar at Sinai. Recall the blood on the wood. The blood on the doorposts. It was the deliverance from bondage of slavery on Passover. And now the shofar in Jerusalem at Passover remembered the blood on the wood, the cross, the blood of the Lamb. And he is our deliverance from the bondage of sin. A third shofar. The disciples heard this every year. You begin to wonder when they heard the shofar at Passover a year after Jesus has ascended, after a year after Jesus rose from the dead, a year after Jesus' resurrection. It's a year later when the shofars were blowing at Passover, and then that fall, when they celebrated the Feast of Yom Teruah, that they also say, yes, we remember. We remember the shofar blasts at Sinai. We remember the shofar blast when King Solomon became king. Remember the shofar blast at Passover, the day the Lamb of God shed his blood so that we will be saved. And what's another shofar that they would have known about? these disciples when they hear Jesus' words and try to understand what Jesus is trying to help them understand is there another shofar that Jesus talked about that they would remember on Yom Teruah let's take a look at a fourth one and we ask ourselves the question what did they hear what did they hear in Matthew 24 on the Mount of Olives when Jesus was teaching them about his coming? He says this in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. I'm going to read it through without any comment first from the New American Standard. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other I want to make some points here because when we take a look at the Greek that's used here in Matthew 24 29 through 31 the Greek word when you look it up in Thayer's Greek lexicon is also a Greek word that's used a number of times in the Septuagint and again the Septuagint is the Greek translation from the Hebrew of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, the Greek word that's used here normally translates shofar. The great shofar. Jesus also says that he will gather together. Now that Greek word, when we take it to the Hebrew using Thayer's lexicon, the word gather is the same word God uses in Deuteronomy and throughout the Hebrew Scriptures about the ingathering of his people. 
Jesus is using the same word when every Jew hears Jesus saying he will gather his elect. They understood this. It's the ingathering of his people. So for disciples of Jesus, these words are awesome. They're speaking of his return and the coming for us, his bride, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Now one verse that they knew that speaks of the great shofar is in Isaiah 27, 12 through 13. Matter of fact, this, this verse is one of the primary verses used in Judaism to talk about the last great shofar and the day of the Lord, and the day of the coming of Messiah. Isaiah 27, 12 through 13. In that day the Lord will start his threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered up. Now that's the Hebrew here. And if you take it to the Greek, it's the same word that Jesus used. In the day of the Lord, his elect will be gathered one by one, O sons of Israel. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, a great shofar. It doesn't say trumpet. And those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord, where? In the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now chapters 24 through 27 of Isaiah is sometimes called the little apocalypse of Isaiah. These chapters seemingly are related to the day of the Lord, the end times. The great shofar is a common belief in Judaism in Jesus' day that before the coming of the day of the Lord there will be a last great shofar blast. We talk about the Jewish rapture, not the Christian rapture. The ingathering of Israel. One rabbi, this is years and years and years after Jesus, said the Jewish people will be gathered up and they will come as doves flying in a cloud to Jerusalem, a cloud. It reminds us of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, where we're going to be taken up into the clouds to meet Jesus. In Ezekiel 36, 24, and Ezekiel 37, 21, we read about the fact that God is going to take and gather his people. The Hebrew word there for take is lachach. It definitely means to take, but it also means to seize, to capture, to take away, to snatch away. And then the word gather. That Hebrew word again, that's translate, that if you translate it to the Greek, is the exact word that Jesus used. So we have to take and gather. And the Hebrew here of lachach is to seize, to capture, take away, snatch away. When we go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, there's the Hebrew word harpazo. It doesn't mean rapture. That was a mistake by Gentile translators in the Roman church. Harpazo is the Greek and it means, listen to this, to seize, to capture, to be taken away. And on top of that, Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14. All of, all of this about God saying, I'm going to take you, I'm going to seize you, I'm going to capture you, I'm going to gather you to myself to bring you back to the land, to stay forever. In Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14, we read about the fact that the dead are going to be rise and taken to Israel. This is amazing. Paul is an Orthodox Jewish Pharisee. He is a Torah scholar. He's teaching probably a bunch of pagan Gentiles in Thessalonica. Could it be that Paul meant the Jewish rapture, the ingathering of Israel? Because we as Gentiles, as we come to faith in Jesus, have become grafted into the olive tree of Israel by the blood of the Lamb. We've become joint heirs with Israel. So therefore, do we share in the joint gathering in the end days? For the believer in Jesus' day, they would have been taught the prophecies of Isaiah as it relates to the coming day of the Lord and the end of the age.
the disciples knew this. This is amazing. Jesus relates the great shofar blast to his return. His disciples knew of the last great shofar. So Jesus, in the very words of God, his own words reminds us of the last great shofar and says he will gather his elect. Who's his elect? Jew and Gentile. Both flocks. He talks about two flocks. The flock of Israel and the flock of the Gentiles that were grafted in. In Deuteronomy and Ezekiel were gathered in the end of days and taken, see, snatched away to be with the Lord forever in the new Jerusalem. Yam Teruah. Rosh Hashanah. The day of the blast, the day of the shofar blast. On Rosh Hashanah, we are under the shadow of Messiah. And on this day, Christian, on this day, church, on this day of God's Moed, we're to remember, we're to remember the day of the Lord, the day of the great shofar blast, the return of Messiah Yeshua. I believe Jesus is preparing his bride for his return. I say, let's consider a church service, a special meeting, a special meeting of, with God on his appointed time. It makes sense to us. Not Rosh Hashanah. You let the Jewish people have their traditions and their meanings. No. We would do the day of the blast, the day of the shofar blast. We would make a joyful, ear-splitting sound to the Lord. He's coming. Get ready. These fall feasts, these appointed times of the Lord definitely remind us of the end of days, the day of the Lord, and the return of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. On this feast, Jewish people have greetings for each other. One of them is Gamar Chatima Besefer HaChaim. May you be inscribed in the Book of Life. But I've changed it. I greet you and say Gemara Chatima Besefer HaChaim Tala. May you be inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life. Another greeting that the Jewish people have is Shana Tova Umatuka. Shana Tova Umatuka. May you have a good sweet year. I changed it. And I greet you by saying, Chaim Tova Umetuka. May you have a good sweet life. A good sweet life in Jesus. Shalom.